Hello, thank you for joining me today. Linda Lamp here. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text. And today we're going to read, I think we'll read two sections today. They both seem to be fairly short. Um, we are in chapter 24, the goal of specialness. Section five is specialness versus sinlessness. And then section six is the Christ in you. And I will attempt to read both of these sections today. Specialness versus sinlessness. Specialness is a lack of trust in anyone except yourself. Faith is invested in yourself alone. Everything else becomes your enemy, feared and attacked, deadly and dangerous, hated and worthy only of destruction. Whatever gentleness it offers is but deception, but its hate is real. In danger of destruction, it must kill, and you are drawn to it to kill it first. And such is guilt's attraction. Here is death enthroned as savior. Crucifixion is now redemption, and salvation can only mean destruction of the world except yourself. What could the purpose of the body be but specialness? And it is this that makes you frail and helpless in its own defense. It was conceived to make you frail and helpless. The goal of separation is its curse. Yet bodies have no goal. Purpose is of the mind, and minds can change as they desire. What they are and all their attributes, they cannot change. But what they hold as purpose can be changed, and body states must shift accordingly. Of itself, the body can do nothing. See it as means to hurt, and it is hurt. See it as means to heal, and it is healed. You can but hurt yourself. This has been oft repeated, but is difficult to grasp as yet. To minds intent on specialness, is it, it is impossible. Yet to those who wish to heal and cannot attack, it is quite obvious. The purpose of attack is in the mind, and its effects are felt but where it is nor is the mind limited. So it must be that harmful purpose hurts the mind as one. Nothing could make less sense to specialness. Nothing could make more sense to miracles. For miracles are merely change of purpose from hurt to healing. This shift in purpose does endanger specialness, but only in the sense that all illusions are threatened by truth. They will not stand before it. Yet what comfort has ever been in them that you would keep the gift your father asks from him and give it there instead? Given to him, the universe is yours. Offered to them, no gifts can be returned. What you can have given specialness has left you bankrupt and your treasure house barren and empty with an open door inviting everything that would disturb your peace to enter and destroy. Earlier I said, not the means by which salvation is attained, nor how to reach it. I, earlier I said, consider not the means by which salvation is attained, nor how to reach it, but do consider and consider well whether it is your wish that you might see your brother sinless. To specialness, the answer must be no. A sinless brother is its enemy, while sin, if it were possible, would be its friend. Your brother's sin would justify itself and give it meaning that the truth denies. All that is real proclaims his sinlessness. All that is false proclaims his sins are real. If he is sinful, then is your reality not real, but just a dream of specialness that lasts an instant crumbling into dust? Do not defend this senseless dream in which God is bereft of what he loves and you remain beyond salvation. 
only this in certain in its shifting world that has no meaning in reality. When peace is not with you entirely, and when you suffer pain of any kind, you have beheld some sin within your brother and have rejoiced at what you thought was there. Your specialness seemed safe because of it, and thus you saved what you appointed to be your savior and crucified the one whom God has given you instead. So are you bound with him, for you are one, and so its specialness, his enemy, and yours as well. And so is specialness, his enemy, and yours as well. That's the end of section six or five, rather, in the chapter 24, the goal of specialness. And now uh, we'll read section six, the Christ in you. The Christ in you is very still. He looks on what he loves and knows it as himself. And thus does he rejoice at what he sees because he knows that it is one with him and with his father. Specialness, too, takes joy in what it sees, although it is not true. Yet what you seek for is a source of joy as you conceive it. What you wish is true for you. Nor is it possible that you can wish for something and lack faith that it is so. Wishing makes it real, as surely as does will create. The power of a wish upholds illusions as strongly as love extends itself, except that one deludes, the other heals. There is no dream of specialness, however hidden or disguised the form, however lovely it may seem to be, however much it delicately offers the hope of peace and the escape from pain in which you suffer not your condemnation. In dreams, effect and cause are interchanged, for here the maker of the dream believes that what he made is happening to him. He does not realize. He picked a thread from there, a scrap from there, and wove a picture out of nothing. For the parts do not belong together, and the whole contributes nothing to the parts to give them meaning. Where could your peace arise but from forgiveness? The Christ in you looks only on the truth and sees no condemnation that could need forgiveness. He is at peace because he sees no sin. Identify with him and what has he that you have not? He is your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet, how gentle are the sights he sees, the sounds he hears, how beautiful his hand that holds his brothers and how lovingly he walks beside him, showing him what he can be seen and heard and where he will see nothing and there is no sound to hear. Yet let your specialness direct his way and you will follow and both will walk in danger, each intent in the dark forest of the sightless, unlit, but by the shifting tiny gleams that spark an instant from the fireflies of sin and then go out, to lead the other to a nameless precipice and hurl him over it. For what can specialness delight in but to kill? What does it seek for but the sight of death? Where does it lead but to destruction? Yet think not that it looked upon your brother first, nor hated him before it hated you. The sin its eyes behold in him and love to look upon it saw in you and looks on still with joy. Yet is it joy to look upon decay and madness and believe this crumbling thing? with freshly already loosened from the bone and sightless holes for eyes, is like yourself? Rejoice, you have no eyes with which to see, no ears to listen, no hands to hold, nor feet to guide. 
Be glad that only Christ can lend you his while you have need of them. They are illusions too, as much as yours. And yet, because they serve a different purpose, the strength their purpose holds is given them. And what they see and hear and hold and lead is given light that you may lead as you were led. The Christ in you is very still. He knows where you are going, and he leads you there in gentleness and blessing all the way. His love for God replaces all the fear you thought you saw within yourself. His holiness shows you himself in him whose hand you hold and whom you lead to him. And what you see is like yourself. For what but Christ is there to see and hear and love and follow home? He looked upon you first, but recognized you were not complete. And so he sought for your completion in each living thing that he beholds and loves and seeks it still for that each might offer you the love of God. Yet he is quiet, for he knows that love is in you now and safely held in you by that same hand that holds your brothers in your own. Christ's hand holds all his brothers in himself. He gives them vision for their sightless eyes and sings to them of heaven, that their ears may hear no more the sound of battle and of death. He reaches through them, holding out his hand, that everyone might bless all living things and see their holiness. And he rejoices that these sights are yours to look upon him and share his joy. His perfect lack of specialness, he offers you that you may save all living things from death, receiving them from each one the gift of life that your forgiveness offers to yourself. So the sight of Christ is all there is to see. The song of Christ is all there is to hear. The hand of Christ is all there is to hold. There is no journey but to walk with him. You who would be content with specialness and seek salvation in a war with love, consider this. The Holy Lord of heaven has himself come down to you to offer you your own completion. What is his yours? What is his is yours because in your completion is his own. He who willed not to be without his son could never will that you be brotherless. And could he give a brother unto you except he be as perfect as yourself and just as like to him in holiness as you must be? There must be doubt before there can be conflict and every doubt must be about change. No, sorry. And every doubt must be about yourself. Christ has no doubt and from his certainty, his quiet comes. He will exchange his certainty for all your doubts if you agree that he is your one with you and that this oneness is endless, timeless, and within your grasp because his hands are his, because your hands are his. He is within you, yet he walks beside you and before, leading the way that he must go find himself complete. His quietness becomes your certainty. And where is doubt when certainty has come? Okay. <clears throat> Just to review, if you followed the earlier readings of this chapter, uh, you know that what my interpretation here is of specialness versus uh, sinlessness. Specialness is the ego's idea that you are somehow unique and special. And it's not that you're not a unique individuation of divinity, but you are divinity in form. And then this, this section about the Christ in you um, how, 
how to describe this. My, my understanding of this has changed with time. And I am very close to uh, the understanding that I believe this section uh, was just talking about. When divinity chooses to manifest as an entity for us to interact with, I believe that that entity is Christ, Yeshua, Jesus, whatever words you use to describe the essence of that character. There is a character that we describe as Jesus Christ. And more and more, it's becoming clear to me that Jesus Christ is, for each of us, the physical manifestation of divinity. Now, there are lots of religious people who claim that they've had an awakening, a connection with Christ. There's a whole realm of religion called uh, born again Christians who would have make this claim that they have awakened to Christ or somehow uh, joined with Christ. These are difficult concepts to, to grasp and, and also to talk about. What I can share with you is my personal experience where I have had um, multiple, what I would call uh, Jesus embodiments. And um, once that happens, as a human being, you feel like you have a split personality because it's not, it's, it, it's, it's, oh, it's not easy to describe this. Um, and, I, and maybe the best thing to do is just tell the story how it happened for me. I'll share one of the, the uh, embodiments that happened. I was in a meditation and I was at a, a, I was at a workshop at a conference and there were a number of people. It, it was a conference being led by a gentleman by the name of Ken Stone his uh, tagline is the sole archaeologist. And so the work we had been doing for several days in a row was really uh, cultivating uh, or, or self-navigating within ourselves to get in touch with our divinity, to get in touch with the divine, to become one with the divine. And in this meditation, I found myself in the woods, standing next to a deep pool of water. There was a stream running to fill it and there was a stream running out of it, but uh, the way it was designed or, or existed, the water would be continually moving, coming in and then uh, eventually leaving. And so I was standing at the edge of this pool and a being that appeared to be Christ or Jesus, whatever word you want to use. I, I call him Yeshua. That was his given name, Yeshua ben Joseph. 
Yeshua was standing in this pool about waist deep. And he beckoned me to join him. And I stepped down into the pool and I was facing him. And he gently took me and he turned me around so that my back was facing his front. And then he put his hands under my arms, like around my armpits. He put one hand under each armpit. And he just drew me into him from behind. And so when that happened, I just, I rather melted and I, I felt myself merging with this other being, with this other physical form. And we became one. And I realized as a byproduct of this meditation and experience that this is how it always is. That the entity that we think of as Christ, that the individual that we think of as Jesus, that that being, that person, that divine being that divine person is available and accessible to each of us, to everyone. Now that experience happened a number of years ago and I have been working and living with that experience ever since. And I, I am continually aware of the fact that I have a companion with me, that, that Yeshua is always with me, in me, a part of me, even, even if they're off doing something else, even if the people who, who, where he lives now are off doing something else. He's still with each of us if we open up to him. He is divinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one, the trinity of one. So I hope that helps with this material. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. I, I, uh, I'm here for you. Uh, you can text me or uh, message me or call me and leave me a message. I don't carry that phone with me all the time. So, uh, but I check it multiple times a day. 907-351-3003. You can also find my website at lindalamp.shop and uh, I will hope to see you here next Sunday for the next section of uh, chapter 24. And uh, it doesn't look like we'll finish it next Sunday. It looks like it's going to take two more readings for it, us to finish this chapter. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Reach out to me if you'd like additional support. Namaste and much love.